Well, hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. And hopefully you can hear me okay, because today we have another storm here. We had storm Kieran last week, I think, and now I think this is storm Debbie hitting us today. 60 mile per hour gust as I'm trying to film this video. And so hopefully you're gonna be able to hear me okay, but we'll get inside the car pretty quickly, I think. But here we are then. We've got the Alpine A110 on this brutally honest review. And this is one I've been really excited for because immediately i'll give credit where credit's due this thing has character a lot of the new cars that i get to test these days they're all sort of very similar and this thing certainly has its own independence certainly got its own style and everything inside has its own quirks as well so straight away right off the bat it's fantastic when it comes to personality so i've been using this car as my daily driver over the last week or so i've done around 500 miles in the thing practically run it in actually because it was delivered to me on less than 500 miles and i feel like i've got to know it quite well and have some interesting things to share with you and it's a bit of a mixed bag this one i'll give it away straight away i'm i'm kind of undecided but i'll tell you at least what i think is great and what i think is not so great immediately though on the styling now, a few of my friends that have seen this car have said they think it's absolutely hideous. But for me, ever since these things came out, almost I think six years ago now, might even be longer by the time this video goes out, I've, I've always loved the way these things look. Again, I'm all for something that's a little bit different. And so this obviously checks that mark immediately. But I think it's gorgeous. I think the front end looks really purposeful, pretty, but also quite angry and pointy. And then at the back, it's just this quite unique shape with the sort of sloping away of the roof and the window, Alpine A110 on the back. And then an interesting exhaust, which reminds me a little bit of the Lamborghini Aventador, actually. So it doesn't sound anything like a Lamborghini Aventador because where that has a 6.5 litre, 12 cylinder engine, we're playing with a four cylinder, 1.8 litre turbocharged engine, which does produce an impressive 258 horsepower but although that might not seem like that much on the face of it this thing comes in at just under 1100 kilograms and i can't think of many new cars these days that get anywhere near that so what that gives you then is a very efficient car but one that also packs a punch when you put your foot down and it is fantastic i'll tell you now on the british b roads it's absolutely made for them and is perfect for them but we'll talk a little bit more about that once we get in the car and get in the car we should really because like i say i think i'm about to blow away and if i don't this might to be honest so let's jump in the car i want to talk you through the interior because i think it's quite interesting um lots of differences there and uh, yeah then we'll go for a drive okay so stepping into the alpine very carefully onto the bag that i've put here for my extremely muddy boots don't want to get this nearly new press car completely filthy um, stepping inside, you're greeted with something quite unique. I've never been in an environment like this. Immediately, if you've ever had any time in a Renault, you notice some similarities, some parts that you would see in a Clio potentially. But apart from that, it's very special. The main thing, of course, as you're getting into a car, the seats. And not only do these look absolutely fantastic with the mix of soft material, and quilted leather with blue stitching to match the outside. You've got the silver inserts, Alpine here. They look stunning, but they also are fantastic to sit in. Extremely comfortable, very uh, supportive and, and huggy, obviously, if you're pushing on a little bit, which is their main purpose. But yeah, just, just very good, actually. I'm very impressed with the seats, but there are a few issues with the seats, obviously them being fixed buckets. There's literally one method of adjustment which is through this rail where you can go forwards and backwards and what i would prefer is if there was a way to lower these seats because onto the second thing really that you notice is what you're looking at and the driving position in this car is not ideal especially if you're used to something like a porsche cayman or maybe a bmw z4 you're sitting quite high up and correct me if i'm wrong but i thought one of the main purposes or one of the purposes of having bucket seats like this is the ability to then not have a bunch of electronic mechanisms under the car which saves you weight but also allows the driver to sit lower down and be closer to that sort of lower center of gravity um, but these are on really sort of almost foot high rails and so you do feel although it might not look like it you do feel like you're sitting quite high up in the cabin 
you sort of look down on the dials and look down on the steering wheel. And the steering wheel itself is also angled a little bit down away from you. You want it to be angled a little bit more towards you. It's hard to really show through the television, but it doesn't feel quite right. When you sink into a BMW or a Porsche, for example, as I've used them already, you just instantly feel like you're in a very comfortable position to drive. But this one throughout the week, I've had it on test. I have been adjusting the steering column. I have been adjusting where I'm sitting. I have even been slouching a little bit like this to try and find the perfect seating position. Uh, it's not quite there. Also a very minor complaint, but with slightly more conventional cars, let's say, there is a good space to put your spare leg, let's say. It's obviously an automatic car. You don't need a foot for the brake or the clutch unless you're on track or your left foot braking or whatever. And there is a resting pad for your leg, but the central column plastic intrudes a little bit into that space. So there's not that much space in the footwell to rest if you're on a longer drive. But I suppose no one is buying this car to traverse continents in. So it's only a minor complaint. Despite some of those points, I love the steering wheel design. I love the blue center line or center marker on the top of the wheel. It feels really nice. Of course, it's a brand new car, so it should do, but it does feel pretty nicely made. It's a good size as well, this wheel. It's not huge and it's not too small like you would have on a Porsche. And the paddles are brilliant. They're fixed to the steering column like a Ferrari. Uh, they're not attached to the steering wheel, so wherever you're moving the wheel, the paddles are always going to be in the same place. They're, they're satisfying to use, which makes a big difference. Uh, I do like them a lot. Also, like a Ferrari, we have this central column where the gear selectors are, so we have neutral drive, reverse, and you press drive again, you get fixed manual mode, which is nice. Interestingly, there's no P. All you have to do is put it into neutral, and hold the parking brake on it and then that's it but there's no actual park gear if that makes sense underneath which you have where you'd find your aux input and a couple of usb ports which you can use to charge your phone or connect to apple carplay which is good i'm very glad it has that above which you have this very tiny storage compartment which i can only think is designed for the actual key which by the way is a bit of a curious thing the key it's basically a Renault key, but in a nice leather pouch. And I found it exceedingly difficult at night to unlock, lock the car, whatever it is you're trying to do. It's really unintuitive to use. Maybe if you had the car for months and months and months and you memorized exactly where the pressure points were, but it can just about fit in this tiny little storage cubby nonetheless, above which you've got air conditioning. Very, very simple. Nothing like heated seats or anything too fancy in here. That's basically your lot. You do have cruise control and a speed limiter in this car, which you activate through these two switches down here, and then you control with the buttons on the wheel. It took a little bit of getting used to, but actually once you do so, it's fairly intuitive to use. Still prefer a conventional cruise control stalk, but this is absolutely fine. Then you just have this sport button here, which you can use to select through three driving modes, normal, sport, and track, which I actually found out by accident. I just sort of held the sport button to see if anything else would happen and it activates track mode, which is as far as I'm aware from sport, just increases the sort of sensitivity of the throttle, uh, makes the gear shifts a little bit more ferocious, if you can call it that, and deactivates traction control. So that's cool. A few minor things as I'm just looking at the window switch buttons here. So for example, you wanna lower your window or bring your window up when the ignition's just on you know not the engine running but you can't so there you go i've pressed the push to start everything's lit up i'm going to go to lower the window won't do it very weird you have to start the engine to activate some of the electronics in the car but as we're on now uh, you're greeted with the digital dials in front of you not a huge fan of these in fact the main thing probably being quite poor resolution I do like the French flag at the bottom under the PRND, which is funny because it says there's a P mode and that we're in P, but there isn't. And in fact, the other day when I was doing some filming with the car, I was jumping out to move cameras around on the outside of the car and leaving the engine running to do so. And it was beeping at me saying, put the car in park. But I had, I'd put the car in neutral and I'd pulled the parking uh, electronic handbrake on, but it was still beeping at me to put the car in park, but it literally doesn't have a park on the left hand side you can use the stalks at the end of the indicator and the wipers to go through 
Um, there's not really that much there. You can get a live rev counter display, which I quite like. You can look at the boost pressure, percentage of throttle input, which is nice. You've got mileage, MPG, range, things like that. That's about your lot in terms of what's in front of you. And then onto this central screen, very much the same story, a little bit low in pixelation, if that's the right way of putting it, but quite low in quality. Pretty sure it's what you would get in a Renault and it's telling me to do something which I don't understand. And there's really, to be honest, it's kind of refreshing, but when you're used to so much functionality, it's, it seems a little bit lacking, but it is a bit refreshing. There's basically nothing to this thing. You've got radio, uh, which is fairly fine. You can choose what you want. You've got your Apple CarPlay, so all the usual functionalities that your phone can do with that. But when you go into the settings, car configuration, the only thing is internal welcome on or off. If you go to system settings, then you can change things like the display brightness. Uh, you can add bass and stuff to the sound system, which it does need. I've got everything maxed out. You change the units and, and that is almost it, actually. That is it, pretty much. You have to go in here to adjust the brightness of the displays. That's fairly standard these days. But what you can't seem to do is adjust the brightness anywhere of the, the instrument cluster. So what happens is just now, actually, when I was driving here and it's half nine in the morning, I went through a tunnel uh, car thought it was night time and so this display in front of me dims so much so that when we came back out into the sunlight I couldn't actually see what speed I was doing um, it was that dim and there's no way to adjust that sort of brightness you can adjust the brightness on the central display so in night mode you can turn it down or up and in day mode you can turn it down or up but when that decides it's night time and goes dim there's nothing you can do about it obviously after about 30 seconds it realized what day of the week it was again and went back to bright but for a 30 second period i couldn't see what speed i was doing so that's a bit annoying i have looked around everywhere to try and find a way of changing it and there is actually a, a setting in here where you can change the nighttime brightness and uh yeah there you, go. you can change night brightness so i can bring the night brightness up so that when that does happen it's less dim and slightly legible but still a bit annoying. Other than that, there's not much to report. The main issue with this interior, and this comes down to functionality. So like I say, the seats are great. I would like them to be a bit more adjustable, but you know, they're bucket seats. Uh, the, the problem actually is functionality in terms of storage. There is none of it. So there's no glove box. There is no door bins, nowhere to put a bottle of water or anything like that. As I mentioned, you've got this tiny little slot that you could fit a credit card in. And you do have space to pop, you know, things like a phone or, you know, a water bottle under here. But a water bottle would, would roll out for sure. And you can get a phone in there comfortably, but it's really hard to access. There is then on some cars, I believe, a pouch that can be specified on the back here, but there isn't in this car. There is though one cubby that you can fit things like a bottle of water into and a tiny little thing here, which you might be able to put a couple of coins in. But that's, that's your lot. Um, it's really lacking in, in storage space, both in the cabin and in the boots as well, which I'll show you um, with some footage in a minute. There's not really anywhere to put your things. There's certainly no cup holder or anything like that. So if I do want to have a bottle of water, it'll go in here and I can just about reach that, but it's more difficult when you want to sort of have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee on your way to work or you want to stop at a Starbucks. There's, there's nowhere to put a hot drink like that. You could put it in there, but at your own peril because I wouldn't guarantee it's not going to go flying over the interior. So that is the main issue. Other than that, we're pretty much there, but along with the seats, um, which are lovely, there's actually some really nice materials in here. The door handles are beautiful, really lovely to hold, or I should say grab handles. But you've got this nice quilted leather here as well, which is lovely to touch, and the French flag along the top of it, which is a really nice feature. It has character to it, and uh, obviously the, the dials are all set up in a, in a French flag with French colours, and I love the Alpine badge in front of you. It's a really stylish uh, cabin, actually, really, really lovely, and most of the things that you touch are, are built, built well. Most of the things you're going to need to use feel nice to hold. If you start scratching around sort of the rest of the doors and even the headliner, fairly nasty plastic on the doors, and this is nothing to write home about up here, but it's actually only a 50 grand car, which is nothing these days and is 
not much when you're comparing it to a brand new Cayman with a bunch of options on it. And actually, you know it's a lightweight car, so you sort of forgive it for feeling a little bit tinny in places. Only other thing to mention is your rear visibility is quite, uh, <laughs> it's like a post box. You can't really see anything out that back window. Although I have to say, it's never really been an issue. You can see enough. It's just a lot less than what you'd be used to. Let's take this thing for a drive because I think that's where it really shines actually, this thing. It is, it's a fantastic driving car. So let's go and, uh, and drive it now and I'll tell you exactly what I mean. fantastic b-road blaster which truth be told is what you're doing most of the time in this country it has 260 horsepower like i say which isn't all that much compared to the likes of things like the audi r8 or the 911 turbo s that i recently reviewed with almost three times that sort of power however having said that because it's only 1100 kilos this car it still does not six in under four and a half seconds and it feels really quick as well and i banged on and on about this in my turbo s review which may or may not be out yet actually but cars like that are just too fast in the united kingdom the highest speed limit anywhere is 70 miles per hour and the police don't have any sense of humor when it comes to speeding if you get caught you get in big big trouble and you're license can be lost and you can end up paying huge amounts of insurance premiums and so speeding is genuinely just not worth the risk and so what's amazing about this car only having 260 horsepower is that I'll demonstrate now I can go first gear all the way to the red line second third into fourth gear and I'm doing 60 miles per hour which is the speed limit here and it was really fun in the Turbo S if I did that, I'd be doing 120 miles per hour and it would have taken the same amount of time. This is utterly brilliant for British roads. And the other thing that makes it so fantastic is how compliant it is. British roads and most roads are just awful in terms of lumps and bumps. They're all over the place. But although it doesn't have that much suspension travel, this thing seems to really soak up the bumps really nicely nothing really unsettles the car and i don't get nervous going into a depression or a bit of camber where i think oh this is gonna hurt or the car's gonna scrape it just soaks it all up and takes it in its stride and is absolutely fantastic it's one of those cars where if you're on a 60 mile an hour twisty road it's one of those cars where you can do 60 miles an hour the entire time there you go, over a really big bump there. Most cars don't like that, but this thing barely troubles it whatsoever. And then the next thing, of course, because it's so light, I suppose, is the steering. It is so, so direct, so light, but also so pointy. If I look at the corner here and I just point the nose there, it's exactly where it goes. And also the feedback you get coming through the wheel is brilliant. I can feel absolutely everything that's going on underneath the car. And these are the things that people talk about in car reviews all the time, but they are so, so important. And this Alpine does the basics so well. the red line it beeps at you to tell you to upshift which I find really annoying and I can't see any way of switching that off right in terms of the sound of this car it's a 1.8 litre engine it sounds like it okay it doesn't sound particularly spectacular they have built in these exhaust overruns into the sound but I have to say they're a little bit embarrassing there's no real depth to them and they just sound so artificial the good news is if you take it out of 
of track or sport mode, you don't get that noise anymore. But what this does have is such a charming sound when you get on the boost. So let's put it in fourth gear, 2000 RPM. If I just plant it, do you hear that? That noise of the intake and then the whoosh, as I guess the dump valve goes, is really fun. I find myself just driving along, I'm in a 30 cruising along, and I'll just go and just get that sound. The great thing with that is you don't have to rev the car out at all to, to hear it. It just makes it on demand under a little bit of turbo boost. It's fantastic. So you can sort of short shift it, shifting it around 3000 RPM and just get that whooshing sound all the way up to 60 miles an hour. It's really oddly fun to play with. So there's no real depth to the sound. I don't really know what it sounds like from outside the car actually. Uh, I can't imagine it sounds particularly good, but it is a four cylinder 1.8 engine. They have tried to put in some exhaust backfires, which as you can hear are a little bit tragic. But other than that, when you get on it, and you hear it sucking in all that air just behind your head. I really like it, sounds great. So let's pop it into normal mode. So we're gonna press the sport button twice. That goes back to sport, into normal. We'll make sure we're in drive. So automatic gearing. And it is a very civilized thing to cruise along in. The steering, as I mentioned, is quite light. So for town driving or just general wafting along, it's fairly nice to deal with. Ride quality, as I've already mentioned, as far as I can tell, it's brilliant. I mean, I guess, does it help that it's so small and it's so light? The tires are quite thin, 205 front, I think 235 rear, uh, but it, it just it goes along very nicely. Yes, it's bumpy, I can feel these rivets in the road here, but it's genuinely very comfortable and, and more comfortable than you would expect looking at it. I thought, I thought it would ride like a, like a Catrum or one of those silly Lotuses with no roof, but it actually glides along the road very, very well. Um, I've been quite surprised by that, so much so that I would call it comfortable. As the seats go, I mentioned there's not any adjustment and I think if you were taller, you wouldn't have an issue, so to speak, with, with headroom, but the view of the displays and the view out of the car, you would just feel too high up. But despite that, in terms of relative comfort, they're, they're great. Um, not had any problems. I think on a really long journey, I'd be wanting for some lumbar or bolster support or some sort of adjustability, recline even. But if you were to sort of just potter about in this thing or to take it out on a Sunday, you're not going to have any issues really at all unless you were seven foot tall, uh, which it might not be the best. But yeah, I think that's been the biggest surprise for me with this is actually how buoyant and, and compliant it is on the road. The gearbox is good. We've got this seven speed gearbox, very smooth. Like I say, in, in normal mode, you don't really notice it changing gear. It's pretty quiet at around 70 miles an hour, you're under 3,000 RPM. It's very civilized in here. When you do pop the car into sport mode or change with the paddles, on the upshifts at least, you've got this nice pop sound, which I do enjoy, and the, the changes are fast. You pull the paddle and it's, it's in the gear you want. It's very, very good. I've not fully been able to get on with the, I guess, linearity or sensitivity of the throttle. Um, I find in normal mode it's almost a bit too slow to respond, it's a bit lethargic under the foot. You have to give it quite a lot of gas to just get it going, but if you go slightly too much it really launches away. In sport mode it's kind of the opposite, you just give it the smallest amount of gas and it, it just sends it. It almost needs to be in between in, in normal mode and yeah it does feel a little bit lethargic off the line. Also in traffic I don't know what this is, I don't know if it's the clutch, but it's only got a thousand miles on it, this car, so I can't really put it down to that. But in sort of five miles per hour or less traffic, that sort of stop start stuff, the car really struggles. It doesn't, ugh, struggle's not the right word, but 
it judges quite a lot almost like you're about to stall a car you know in a manual manual gearbox car when you first pass your test or you're learning to drive and you, you know you, you've got the, got the biting point but you're, you're so close to stalling and it sort of judges the entire car it's a bit like that I can't really demonstrate uh, now on a national speed limit road but yeah it, it feels I don't know like the clutch is about to give in something's juddering it's not a very pleasant experience in fact we went to a firework display the other night Katie and I and we were queuing for about an hour to get in and it was doing it the whole time and I was getting really annoyed by it actually um, like I say it could be car specific it'd be a bit strange because it's only just done a thousand miles this car if it was clutch related but yeah just just a, a thing I've picked up on over over using this for the past week the other thing with these bucket seats it's quite hard to get in and out of the car you do develop a bit of a knack for it but the way I've got my seat position set I have the steering wheel or the steering column all the way out and all the way down to kind of compensate for the positioning of the dials and, and the seat which means getting in and getting out I'm always fighting between a tiny gap between the wheel and the seat and also the way the doors are they're quite long so if you're in a car park in a quite tight space there's just no way you're getting out you need to be able to open the door almost all of the way to get out comfortably just another thing to bear in mind but yeah as we're driving along at 60 miles an hour now it's very very quiet um, very civilized and I suppose I'm going on about that because it's not really what I expected I, I thought it would be tinny I think is the right word I, I looked at it and thought that's just gonna be horrendous to cruise along in but it is really civilized even the sound of the cars going past very sedated really nice little place to sit this for short to medium journeys and as we're just coming out of a 40 now I'll engage sport mode one button another button to just well, I don't even need to press the button I'll just pull the paddle go into second gear and just enjoy that third into fourth gear pull up to 60 miles an hour which is fun every time and the great thing about this car also is it's just so efficient over all of the driving I've done in fact I can find the figure for you now over all of the driving I've done I've averaged around 32 miles per gallon on this thing and like I say I've done around 500 miles a lot of it has been driving like a bit of a like a bit of a loon and some of it has been motorway cruising or country road cruising but you really can rag this thing and not see the economy go down too much obviously that's thanks to the tiny little engine behind me but it's just very very efficient it's only a 45 litre tank which means you're going to run out quicker but it does also mean when you fill the car up it's never that expensive even if things, this thing was completely empty and you were filling it up on the motorway at two pounds a litre it'd be less than 90 quid to fill it up but most of the time it's around 50 quid when you fill the car up and that will do you at least 300 miles because it will get over 45 miles per gallon on a run in fact if you haven't watched it already i did a bit of a test between driving at 60 and 70 miles per hour to see the difference it makes in terms of efficiency and i used this car and you'll see that when i did the 60 mile an hour run i got well over 40 miles per gallon uh, cruising and i also did at 70 actually so this thing is very efficient you could if you were commuting i reckon get 45 miles per gallon pretty easily from this thing uh, which even with the 10 gallon tank means you'd get over 400 miles of range and like i say when you put your foot down it doesn't seem to hurt the range or the the economy too much it's very impressive so i have to say that apple carplay is great when you plug it in everything's there that you would need the screen's very easy to reach it's also very responsive none of that haptic touch nonsense or anything like that it just works it's really good the only slight annoyance is the only way to control the volume or to skip tracks other than touching the screen uh, is with this weird stalk here as i mentioned earlier i should say yes you can change the track with the screen or with a scroller wheel on the back but the only way to actually adjust the volume that i found is through these buttons so your passenger can't change anything which i guess is, is good and bad um, but it's also takes a bit of getting used to but a bit annoying i'd like a button or a little wheel in the middle where i can adjust you know adjust the volume of the radio 
from that because sometimes when you're driving it's just easier to reach here than to come down here and fiddle with this weird fugly stalk as I referred to it as earlier but other than that there's not really any complaints in terms of drivability it's a little bit yeah the bucket seats are impractical there's nowhere to put anything the only way to access the front boot which is a bit of a dinner tray as I'll show you now is with a lever in the passenger side footwell now I don't know if that's because it's like normally a left-hand drive car or it's made in a left-hand drive country and that would be convenient for the driver obviously to reach here and do it but they haven't switched it over either way for right-hand drive car so the only way to access the front boot is over there which I can't reach from here I'm not going to go around and open the door and do it like that so I end up only using the rear boot anyway which is really small as you can see I've got a rucksack in there some shoes and a coat and it's you know that's pretty much a lot you're certainly not going to get a suitcase in there and you wouldn't really get a suitcase in the front because it's too shallow so it's really soft bags only this car if I have my seat forward I can get probably a small bag behind me like a rucksack at the push but really there's not that much storage in the car so it, it's not something you're going to want to take on big long journeys that's for sure so what I can say about this car then is if you're coming from like a Porsche or a BMW Audi you know a German car you're going to be a little bit shocked in the general lack of refinements in here you know you don't have heated seats you don't have adaptive cruise control you don't have a bunch of functionality in the infotainment screen only a few buttons as well but this thing makes up for it in terms of its character. I mean, I was looking at it again when I was filming the B-roll you've been watching throughout this video of the outside of the car. And it's such a nice thing to look at. There's so many lines and shapes, you know, the windows at the back just behind me here are, are curved, it's curved glass. You've got the French flag just there as well. The A Alpine logo on the filler cap, but they've also put it on the other wing where there is no filler cap. There's lots of cool little design quirks and the wheels look really good I, I really think this is a, a quirky car the interior is different to anything I've ever experienced before which I give it points for because sometimes getting into any old press car or whatever it is and it all feeling kind of familiar in the same is a bit boring yes that's nice but I prefer something to have a bit of, of character and, and this thing has sh shed loads of it and then to drive it's just really fun like every time I've driven this thing I've enjoyed it and I think that's down to all of those quirks but although this is the biggest cliche in the history of car reviewing it is like a go-kart it's literally like a go-kart with a number plate um, that's how it feels and I think that's just so fun isn't it you know even driving around town now I, I'm enjoying myself this is a nice experience far less dull than I don't know what to say but I mean I could be in that 200 grand turbo s and not having as much fun as I, I am now and then when you do get out onto a b road you can drive this thing really fast sensibly you can absolutely smash it through the gears and not be breaking the law which is the biggest bonus of all and then it feels like it's made to be on those roads it, it drives so well it goes over bumps so compliantly it's fast enough but it's not like scary I'm a big big fan of this car and uh, I have to say when I first got in it I was really like almost laughing at how weird it was and I thought oh gosh this thing's terrible but after a week with it I've really bonded with this thing and I genuinely don't want to give it back um, I think it's fantastic and I, I think it's a shame you don't see more of them on the road so if you're in that sort of 50 grand sports car market please don't rule this thing out go and drive one I think initially you're going to be a little bit disappointed because you you will just notice where it's lacking but try and spend a day with one and, and take it into the countryside take it on some like real good British B roads and I think you'll be really impressed then you'll be disappointed that's for sure so thank you all for watching this video I hope I've given you a nice summary of what it's like to I guess live with an Alpine A110 for the week but that was my brutally honest review and there's nothing that's brutally bad about it I, I suppose so 
very uh, very impressed with the Alpine A110. I'd be excited to try another one. There's an Alpine A110S. I think there's an R, and there's various other editions they've put out recently. So yeah, I'd be loving to, to try one of them. And I've just arrived at the dentist where I've got to have a root canal, I think. So yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Which brings me on to one final point in that the thing's really small and it's quite easy to park, which we're gonna try and demonstrate now by reverse parallel parking into this very tight space. But it's not often that I get a new car delivered and it's smaller than what I'm used to. You know, all new cars this day, these days are, are huge, aren't they? But this thing, easy peasy. What a car. Yeah, so thank you all for watching this one. Shout out. Hope you've enjoyed it. Do comment below if you've had an experience with one of these, whether you agree with me or not, what you think on it. But yeah, if you're in any way sort of considering one of these or not and just want to have a go, please try and drive one. They're brilliant, brilliant things. I think you just need to give it a bit of time to get under the skin of it and, and to get to know it. So yeah, thank you so much to Alpine for supplying me with this car. It's been really special. I've really enjoyed my time with it and I'm very keen to get my hands on another one if, if possible. Also, I will say I would buy one of these cars. I think if I was in that market, I would seriously, seriously think about buying one. I think they're great value for money. I think they're different. You don't see many of them on the road. And actually, it doesn't have 0 to 60 in this and this engine and this exhaust and this adaptive suspension pack or whatever. But it actually just does everything so well. And nine times out of 10, when you're, when you're driving, the sort of driving you're doing, you're gonna have more fun in this thing than you would in something much more complicated and with a special badge on it. Anyway, it's probably enough waffling for this video. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon. Oh my goodness. Picked a good day to do this, didn't I? Crikey.